Welcome, everybody. Uh, today we have with us uh, Daniel Ravicher, who is uh, the director of the Public Patent Foundation. And the Public Patent Foundation, I think, uh, has a very important role in uh, our system in the United States. Uh, it gives the it gives the public voice and injects the public voice into the patent uh, system and into the legal framework. So uh, one could say that the foundation is really tasked with uh, protecting some of the freedoms and rights that are not so often explicitly spelled that the public should enjoy from this system. Uh, Daniel is a lecturer as well at the uh, Benjamin Cardozo School of Law. And let's see, I'm reading here. He started uh, his patent law practice with Skadden Upslate Magar from Flom LLP. And then he worked at a couple of other law firms uh, here. I'm going to skip this uh, at the US Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit in Washington, DC. He's a registered patent attorney, and he writes and speaks frequently on patent law, including testifying before the US Congress on the topic of patent reform. And as a result of his accomplishments and professional reputation at P and uh, intellectual property, let's see. I think we should welcome uh, Daniel and list, uh, hear from him what he has to say about the defense of the public patent system. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. Thanks for having me here, and thanks for all of you for coming. Um, before I get started, I'd just like to say I'm very impressed. I've never been to Google's campus before. I really like the atmosphere here. Just had lunch in the cafeteria. I think you guys, uh, uh, I'm very, very pleased to have been asked to come here, and I'm very impressed by what, what you guys have going on here. So I'm here to talk about the patent system and about my organization's role therein. But before we get to that topic, let's just make sure we're all on the same page, because maybe not everyone here has the same familiarity with patents. By definition, a patent is a government-granted exclusive right for a limited term. Now, you may have heard other words used to describe what a patent is. You may have heard the words intellectual property. You may have heard just the word property, all these things. Those are more atmospheric-type marketing words, the true definition of a patent is it's a government-granted exclusive right for a limited term. So we're all on the same page of what a patent is. Now, why does the government do this? How many people are generally in favor of the government granting exclusive rights to other people to do things? You like government granting exclusive rights? How many people do not like the government granting exclusive rights to people? Okay. I'm with that group. I'm more of a conservative. I generally don't like the government saying that Boris is the only one allowed to wear brown belts, and no one else has the right to wear brown belts without Boris's permission. I generally believe in freedom and that people should be allowed to do whatever they want to do, although there are times when government needs to act. The role of law, as you learn in one of your first days of law school, is to solve collective action problems. How many people here have heard of what a collective action problem is? Right, so this is a collective action problem is when if we all did what we wanted, we would make the world a better, a worse place. And so we all need to come together and agree not to do that thing. So example, we'd all be better off driving on the 101 at 100 miles per hour because we get to where we're going faster, we get to spend more time with our loved ones and friends, and the world would be a better place for us. But if everyone in this room and everyone out there on the 101 freeway drove 100 miles per hour, the world would be worse because there'd be more accidents, safety would go down, there'd be injuries, there'd be more pollution. And so to solve this collective action problem, which is a way to get people to agree to not do something that's in their own self-interest because if everyone does it, it's to society's negative interest, is to pass law. So the only purpose of law is to solve collective action problems. So what is the collective action problem that patent law is meant to address? Well, many people think or say and, mean, and even believe that it's to incentivize innovation. That if we don't grant these exclusive rights for a limited term, people won't make an investment into developing new technologies. Because if there is no exclusive right, once they develop this new technology, they will be free ridden upon 
by everyone else who didn't make those investments, and the initial developer won't be able to recoup that investment that they made, and thus no one will ever have the first mover disadvantage of being the one to make the investment to blaze the trail if everyone else is allowed to come along. But that's actually not the purpose of the patent system. The purpose of the patent system is to advance the state of technology available to the public. Now, some people think, well, that's two of the same things. I can show you that they're not exactly the same, although sometimes they're frequently aligned. If we were to make patents last for a million years, and we were to make patents punishable by death, that would incentivize more innovation than our current patent system, because patents only last 20 years, and they're only enforceable for money damages. Does anyone dispute that enlarging the power or the remedies available for patent infringement would increase the incentives to innovate, right? So there is an increase in the incentive to innovate, but we don't do that because that's not the true purpose of the patent system. The true purpose is to balance the incentive with the ultimate disclosure and the freedom to access that disclosure once the limited term ends. And just to ask what other people think about the purpose of the patent system, we can look at this little document called the Constitution, which some people think is relevant, and Thomas Jefferson, what he had to say. So when you get into debates with people about the patent system, they frequently corner their debate on this, well, you, if you reduce the strength of patents, you'll decrease the incentive to innovate which I usually respond with saying, okay, you've convinced me, I've changed my mind, let's make patent infringement punishable by death, and let's make patents last a million years, and pretty soon they get the, the point I'm making by that absurd example. Okay, so critical legal theory is like doing physics and including friction, right? Most physics you learn, you learn without taking into consideration friction. But friction is a real world thing. So you can't solve real world problems with basic physics because it doesn't take into account real world practicalities. Critical legal theory borrows the same concept, which says there are personal self interests which malign people from doing what they should do or which we could expect people to do. This is like corruption, right? Political officials have personal incentive to take bribes because then they have more money. So that is a problem of the legal system that has to be taken into account when creating a legal system. Because if you create a system that is susceptible to such uh, collective action problems, again, this is someone doing what's best for them, even though it's worse for society, then your legal system won't withstand scrutiny. Some of the collective action problems within the patent system today is we have an arms race incentive. What do I mean by that? If my competitor gets more patents, then I am incentivized to get just as many patents, if not more, because I need to defend myself. And in return, they're going to have to get more. And neither of us are incentivized to have a moderate level of patents, because the other guy's always going to want to have more than me, so they have less risk of being sued for infringement than me, or that they have more threats that they can make against me. Pollution. This is a typical collective action problem in the environmental law space and also in the patent law space. We don't have incentives ourselves to make sure the patents we get are really strong and valid. We have incentives to get all types of patents, including those which are of questionable validity. Because even a questionable validity patent is better than no patent at all. To make an example, if a store was giving out lottery tickets and only some of the lottery tickets they were giving out were winners, are you incentivized to take as many lottery tickets as you can get, even knowing some of them will be losers? Of course, you're incentivized to take as many things you can get, assuming the transaction cost of getting them is low enough, and then you can muddle through to find out which lottery tickets are winners and which ones aren't. So in order to address the concerns of a critical legal theorist, you have to have procedural checks and balances which ensure that the system is not subject to these failings of the collective action problem for the actors. And in a patent system, this means basically two things. We have to ensure high patent quality or high quality of decision making within the patent system, which means we don't allow decisions to be influenced by corruption. We don't allow decisions to be influenced by being overburdened. We make decisions based on substantive, deliberative, contemplative thought. And we also need balanced policies. 
Now, how do you come up with a fair and balanced policy other than turning into Fox News? Well, traditionally, the way you address this issue is you ensure that all of the interests which are affected by the legal system are present in policy-making decisions, right? Everyone should speak their turn, and then the policy decision-makers get to decide where to draw the line, and not always everyone's going to win. If everyone's heard the quote, you know, democracy is two wolves and a lamb deciding on what to have for dinner. And liberty is the lamb being well armed with persuasion and facts to try to carry his day. So you can't always get what you want, but if the system incorporates all of the affected interests and what they want and what they think is good for them, then you have to have faith that the policymakers will do what's best for all of society, which includes all of those interests. So who all needs to be at the included in policy-making decisions in the patent system? Who are the interests affected by the patent system? Generally, these are the only three categories which people can think of. Patent holders, patent lawyers, and those people accused of patent infringement. Most people think if you were to draw a list of who's everyone that gets impacted by the patent system. If you're not one of these three people, then the patent system doesn't impact you. Well, I think that's wrong. I think it's leaving one big group out of the question. And therefore, if you're leaving one group of affected people out of the policy-making process, your policy isn't going to be balanced for everyone in society. And that group is the public. And we're going to come back to some examples of how I see the public gets impacted by the patent system. Even if your grandmother has no idea what a patent is, she still can be impacted by the patent system. Okay, so before I get to that, let's just take a few years back and go through a little bit of history about where the patent system has been. About half a century ago, 40 years ago, patents were under severe attack. The entire idea of patents were completely rejected and uncomfortable. There was an extreme skepticism about exclusive rights. So the second group of people who raised their hand saying they don't like the government giving monopolies to people, this is what we had pre preeminently throughout the legal world in the 60s and 70s. Part of this was driven by the express vision of how a patent was inhibiting competition. There was one patent holder using a patent to keep another competitor off the market. And this resulted in increased prices, less competition, less innovation, etc. This has also coincided with the height of antitrust law in the United States. And the law and economic movement was just at its infancy. Have anyone here ever heard of the law and economics movement? Okay, this is a theory of legal justification that's tried to move away from morality, which has traditionally been the justification for law and making society better by solving collective action problems. This is a school of legal theory coming out of Chicago, which says law should not be driven by morals because those are arguable. Law should be driven by what's financially good for society. So whatever makes more money for society is better. Whatever makes more money for companies, whatever creates more jobs, is better. And that's the law we should have. And we should give up this fight over what's good and evil. Well, this movement didn't come to preeminence until the 80s. So at this point, there wasn't this arm of legal theory contrasting uh, the anti-exclusive rights feeling. So the result was severe oversight and hostility towards patents. Now. In response, the law and econ movement started getting published and recognized, and there started to be this divergent view of exclusive rights, just like when I asked the question at the beginning, and some people said they're in favor of exclusive rights, and some people said they're opposed. Reasonable minds can disagree. So there wasn't this categorical skepticism over the grant of exclusive rights. There were also special interests expressing the benefits to themselves of patents. Does anyone here want to guess an example of a special interest which is benefited by patents? Anyone want to guess? <laughs> so this drive towards patents help us, and we're big companies, and there's a debate going on about the pros and cons of exclusive rights. And look at all the economic benefit that patents provide resulted in a dramatic shift from oversight and hostility to 
unashamed, unabashed expansion of the patent system in the 80s and the 90s. And perhaps the largest example of this expansion was patent holders went to Congress and they bought themselves a home court advantage. Pretty nice. In the general legal system, you have a trial in your geographical area. So there's what are called district courts throughout the country. Every state has at least one. And you do a trial in federal court in your local geographic area. And then when you appeal that, you have a right to appeal to what's called a court of appeals. And there are 13 various courts of appeals throughout the country. Uh, California is in the Ninth Circuit along with Oregon and Washington and Nevada. Uh, and so you then appeal your case to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So there's a patent case in California. It used to go to the Ninth Circuit. If there is a patent case in New York, it would go to what's the Second Circuit. If there is a patent case in Florida, it would go to the Eleventh Circuit. And this is traditionally how federal law gets developed, because then if the Ninth Circuit and the Second Circuit disagree on an issue, the Supreme Court sits above them to solve what are called circuit splits, where you have two circuit decisions which are different from one another, and the role of the Supreme Court over all the circuit courts is to solve that problem. Well, patentees were not doing very well in court. They were losing time and time and time and time again. So they went to Congress and said, we need a specific court of appeals to take all patent cases from anywhere in the country. And this one exclusive court of appeals will hear all patent appeals. And you need to make the judges on that court understand how good patents are and how good for society patents are. So Congress was more than happy to oblige. And we had created in 1982 the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit instead of the Ninth Circuit or Eleventh Circuit, CAFC. This court, it created about 25 years ago, has routinely and categorically issued opinion after opinion after opinion which have expanded patent law. Now, even when they do things that some of us believe conflict with Supreme Court precedent, the Supreme Court has generally been unable to get involved because we don't have these circuit splits between the Federal Circuit and any other circuit because no other circuit is hearing patent cases. So in this essence, the CAFC had become the de facto Supreme Court for patent cases. And they were stuffed, at least initially the CAFC was, with judges who were very pro-patentee. In fact, several of the judges were legislative staff to the Congress people who created the CAFC. So where are we today? In the patent system, we have law which is exactly like law in all other systems. There's a general fundamental theorem of law which says the easiest type of law to get created is that which benefits a small concentrated group while harming a large diverse group. Now, why is that the case? Well, these small concentrated group of beneficiaries each derive more profit from this law or proposed law and therefore have more resources to lobby Congress, do marketing, PR, whatever, to advance or advocate their position. Whereas the large diverse group of people who are each paying a much smaller amount of cost, none of them are incentivized to fight the movement of the law against their interests. I already discussed the judicial bias of pro-patents and patent expansion of the CAFC. And the USPTO, which is the administrative agency relevant in the patent system, itself has been directed by congressional and judicial bias towards patent systems to implement policies and make decisions in favor of patents. So nowhere in here, if we go back a few slides, So we have patentees. They are part of the small group which benefit from patents. Patent lawyers, like myself, I have a job because of the patent system, so I'm generally in favor of its existence. So there's part of the small group that benefits from the patent system. Accused infringers. Now, you would think they'd be part of the people who are opposed to the patent system. But in reality, a lot of the accused infringers are part of the first group, patentees themselves. So while they may want sometimes a little bit of fixing of the system, they're generally in favor of an enlargement of the system just like patentees because they are patentees themselves. But the public's interests in the patent system are not being represented. 
So when the three branches of government fail to represent the public interest, what traditionally happens and has happened over time is you have civil society or public interest groups created. And that's why I left private practice some five years ago to start my organization, which is a 501c3 nonprofit whose mission is to represent the public's otherwise unrepresented interests in the patent system, and particularly the public's interest against low quality and unbalanced policy. Now, there are two main concerns that I and my board and staff have. One is the threat the patent system poses to the public's economic interest. The other is the threats to civil liberties. Now, I'm going to get into more specifics in just a minute, so if you want some examples, just hold on. Now, what we do when we determine there's a threat worth our time and effort is if there's a specific patent or group of patents which are causing an extremely harmful threat to society, we will undertake an administrative procedure to challenge those patents. That administrative procedure is called a re-examination. We do our own scientific and technical research into the patent to see if it's valid. And if we believe it isn't, we send evidence to the PTO asking them to revoke the patent because we have found some new evidence that proves it wasn't a new idea or it wasn't an unobvious idea. For a class of threats, we will advocate for a change in policy so that those threats are addressed up at the beginning of the process, not downstream at the specific patent stage. Okay, so what are some examples of patents that have caused economic threat to the public? One large area where patents harm the public is in the pharmaceutical industry. Patents are used by pharmaceutical companies to bar entry of competitors, and namely brand name pharma uses patents to preclude generics from entering the market. This causes a net negative, if the patent is unjustified, that is an undeserved monopoly. And so the pharmaceutical company is seeking what's called rents or extracting undeserved profits from the marketplace by being able to charge this undeserved monopoly and taking those profits out of society. So when Medicare pays for prescription drugs or your health insurance is more expensive paying for prescription drugs because of an undeserved monopoly, that's a net negative economic effect on society. Human embryonic stem cells. There's one patentee which owns a collection of patents on basic human embryonic stem cells in whatever form they exist. They were using these patents to preclude other people from doing research. I think that harms the public. I think it's good for the public, for anyone who wants to do research, to be allowed to do it. And I don't think patent law, whose purpose is to advance science, should be used as a tool to preclude anyone else from doing research. Monsanto is a large agricultural company. They had patents on modified beans or modified seeds. And farmers would buy these seeds, plant them, save some for the next season, and plant those. Well, Monsanto said that was patent infringement. And they'd have run around suing dozens of farmers, putting many of them in bankruptcy and taking their family farms, because they said, well, what you're doing violates our patents because you still are making and using our patented modified seeds. Now, my concern in this case wasn't so much on the substance of the patents, but on the fact that a lot of these farmers didn't have the resources to even hire a defense. You shouldn't be allowed to win a legal case just because your other side can't hire lawyers. I think there's something fundamentally unfair about that. And software and business method patents, we have to ask, and there's a healthy debate going on, including a book by Besson and Muir, which was recently published, about whether or not introducing patents into these industries causes an increase in innovation or a decrease in innovation. So let's ask a couple people who have been in the software industry what they think. And I'll let you read the quote for a minute. If anyone wants to take a guess, I don't have any prize to offer you, but other than the respect and admiration of your peers. Right, so this is one that people have heard a lot. So Bill Gates said, we are forced to patent as much as we can. This, sound, this is the arms race, which I mentioned earlier, right? We're encouraged to waste all this money getting as many patents as we can. I thought this was a very honest statement, and this is a very helpful statement. 
Okay? Here's a harder one. That one was easy. This is the advanced class. Don't be shy. If you have a guess, yell it out. No guesses? Come on, who? No. Boris said you people were smart. Come on. Yeah, that's a hard one. That's pretty obscure. People have heard of Cisco, right? So this is pretty, don't listen to what Dan Ravisher has to say about software patents. Listen to people actually in the software industry, what they say about patents. And they say they're a waste of time and money. We're not doing any more innovation than we would otherwise because we're incentivized not by patents. We're incentivized by the needs of our customers in the marketplace. So one has to ask, is there a legitimate reason to have patents in industries that cause a drag on innovation instead of a spur to innovation? So what are some policies that I frequently propose and that you could debate yourself that would help protect economic interests? One would to eliminate injunctions as a matter of law. Um, if we look at patent law purely as an economic vehicle, then so long as the defendant is capable of paying some amount of money, they should be allowed to do what they want. So here's a hypothetical. Let's say I had a patent on the cure for AIDS. Now, there's nothing in patent law that requires me to make this cure for AIDS or to allow anyone else to make the cure for AIDS. I can sit on it, and I can laugh at all the people with AIDS if I want to. Okay? Now, let's say Boris came along, and he wanted to make the cure for AIDS available to people in the United States. I can sue him and get an injunction to prevent him from doing that. How many people think that makes sense? Yeah, it's ridiculous. Okay? But... Injunctions make patents stronger, and that benefits this small, concentrated group of patentees. So anytime you talk about restraining injunctions or possibly even eliminating them because they make no economic sense, they get very threatened, and they say, you're going to decrease the incentives for innovation, and pharmaceutical, we're never going to come up with new pharmaceutical drugs, and all these kind of parade of horribles. But if you think about it economically, there's no economic justification. Sure, as long as there's a price and a judge's job is to decide what's a fair price for Boris to pay me to practice my patent. I'm not saying Boris should be allowed to do it for free, but we should go to court and the judge should decide what a fair price is. But I shouldn't be allowed to preclude someone from practicing my technology. This goes back to the software one. If patents aren't increasing the rate of innovation in an industry, they should get their nose out of it. That's an extreme position, I know but it's one that I hold on to. There should be an exception from patent law for research. How many people here today thought there was an exception to patent infringement for research? Lots of people, right? It's a common misconception. Don't feel bad. Lots of people think, how could the patent system, which is supposed to encourage research, be used to actually stop research? It's true. There is absolutely no exception from patent infringement for research. That seems ridiculous to me. Now, of course, if after your research, you've come up with a marketable commercial product. Now you need to negotiate with the patentee for a license. But why should the patentee in the human embryonic stem cell case be the only one allowed to do human embryonic stem cell research? They shouldn't. That doesn't make sense. And we also have to make sure that the procedural goals of the patent system are accomplished. And that's not, that's not a non sequitur. That's not something to be taken for granted. It's very difficult to address abuse and manipulation and gamesmanship in any legal system. Okay, so what, in what ways, if any, do patents threaten civil liberties? Well, there are two types of freedoms. There's procedural freedoms and substantive freedoms. And most non-lawyers don't even recognize procedural freedoms. They think of substantive freedoms like freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Procedural freedoms you know as the right to a fair trial, the right to a jury trial, the right to be represented if you're arrested and accused of a crime. These are rights that you have in a fair process. And in the Monsanto Farmer case, I'm concerned about the procedural harms caused when a patentee who is well-resourced alleges patent infringement against a defendant who can't even afford to hire an attorney to defend them. I think that's unfair, and I think that's a perverse violation of their right to be fairly represented in court. We see this also in the software space. We see patent holders who go around intentionally suing 
single or two, two person owned websites for patent infringement. They'll send them nasty letters or they'll file lawsuits against them, knowing that that defendant has no ability to hire an attorney to come in and defend them. And they're basically at the whim of the patentee to accept some type of $50,000, $100,000 payoff to go away. In addition to the procedural concerns that I have, there are also substantive constitutional concerns that I have about the patent system. So what are some examples? I don't know if you guys can read this or not. This is a patent issued in 2001 on a method and apparatus for delivering electronic advocacy messages. Everyone see the title? How many people have never seen a patent before? Everyone's seen a patent before? Okay, so. so this is an example of what the patent is trying to cover. Dear representative, I think you should vote yay or nay on a particular bill. This scares me a little bit. It scares me that the United States government is saying Juno Online Services is the only party in all of America allowed to do this thing. And if you want to do this thing, which is send email to your representative asking them to vote yay or nay, you need to go call up Juno and ask them how much it's going to cost. Now people say, but Dan, you're, you're chicken little, right? Juno would never assert this patent. I, I'd rather it not exist in the first place. Why, doesn't, why does it exist in the first place? This, shouldn't, this type of a patent should not exist. There should not be a patent on how to email your elected representatives to express your position on some law. Okay, what's another example? This is an electronic voting system patent. And for those of you that may or may not know, the boundaries of a patent, the legal four corners of the patent are defined by single sentences at the very end. And these single sentences are called claims. And they actually start with the language, I claim a table having a top and four legs. And therefore, you just go around and you say, do you have a top and four legs? If yes, you infringe my patent. If no, you don't. So here is the first claim of this patent. And I'll give everyone just a minute to read it through. I'm sorry if you guys in the back, if you can't read the text. So basically, this is an electronic voting system with a computer an absentee ballot manager agent. Sounds like software to me. Or maybe it's just some guy with a pencil. Either way, we're not sure. A mobile memory unit. A paper ballot. The absentee ballot manager agent has a means for creating electronic representation of the ballot and storing the results in the database. Now, who thinks the owner of this patent should be the only person in all of America to be able to do this thing? Somebody owns stock in this company? I've never even heard of them before. So when someone says patents can never influence my right to vote, patents can never influence my right to freedom of speech, to advocate my legal opinions to my representatives, they don't know what they're talking about. Now, here's a, here's a really obscure one. Anyone want to guess what this is a patent on? This is a patent on one of the most safest and effective ways for a woman to undertake her constitutional right to have a first trimester abortion. Right. RU 486. There's nothing in the law that would preclude this patent from being acquired by the Right to Life Coalition and using this patent and asserting it against any woman who wanted to exercise her constitutional right and preclude her from using this technology. Absolutely no defense. How many people have a problem with that? I have a problem with that. You don't have to express your political opinions in front of your peers if you don't want to. I have a problem with that. 
Mm -hmm. So that threat's almost over. Almost yeah, over. it expired in 2006, right? But you can sue people for six years, right? But tomorrow there may be a, another safer and a more effective, right? But good catch. <laughs> Maybe these people are smart. The question was, uh, the patent is issued in two, 1986, so isn't the threat almost over? Yes. So uh, what are some policies that I advocate that could help protect civil liberties from the patent system? One is anything that relates to the exercise of a civil liberty should be excluded from patentable subject matter. That's pretty simple. Secondly, how many people have heard of fair use, right? It only exists in copyright and trademark. There's no such thing as a fair use of patents. I think that's wrong. I think there should be a fair use of patents. And we also should ensure that no one loses a patent case or is forced to pay a license fee to a patentee simply because they can't access legal representation. Okay, are there any lawyers in the room other than me? Okay, if you have any lawyers, one, Okay, just for you, sir, one slide. <laughs> now, if you have any lawyers who are friends and they think when you start talking about patents, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Patents are no big deal. Patents don't impact anything. Just pull up this patent. <laughs> and this thread is not over, sir. This was just issued in 2000 and... Uh, Three. So for at least the next 15 years, no lawyer in the country is allowed to do this thing without the permission of Louis Calverine. I think he lives on West 50th Street, which is in my neighborhood. Thank you very much for your time. Be happy to hear questions and comments. So, yes, sir. So, with regard to software uh, and business, you know, method uh, patents, I've always thought that even if they would be patentable, they should be patentable for a lot less than 20 years. I mean, is that a possible? way to address some of these issues is just make certain classes of, you know, or certain industries or certain classes of issues have a much shorter time limit? Uh, that's a proposal that some people make. Of course, the problem is you start getting into line drawing between what gets 20 years and what gets seven years. Right. And it's difficult to say, well, what is a software patent? If it's purely just an algorithm or a method patent, that's an easier case. But what if it's actually a hardware claim but the hardware is generic commodity processor and memory, and it's really the software which is doing the results. So it's hard to draw the line. But even beyond that procedural and critical legal theorist critique of that proposal, the more important one is that patents lasting for 20 years aren't a good thing for the software industry. So making them weaker or less isn't going to make them more of an incentive, right? So right. if they're not an incentive to development, if people aren't making uh, advancements because of the patents today, why have them at all? Well, the answer is because they make patent attorneys really rich and they make patent holders really rich. And that's the reason why we have patents on software and business methods. So what is your organization actually doing to lobby against you know, patents and software and whatnot? We've participated in several briefs on this issue, including one at the Supreme Court arguing that patents on software are not eligible. And when you make this case, um, and people think that you're a little bit radical and you're not uh, economically intelligent, you can tell them that Eli Lilly, also a large pharmaceutical company, submitted a brief to the Supreme Court, Microsoft v. AT&T, arguing that software should not be patentable. So if I'm crazy for arguing this, so is Eli Lilly. And very few people would call Eli Lilly crazy. Right. So Thanks. that's a good proposal you came up with, but I don't think it addresses the problems which we currently right. see. Right. I mean, I look at it as something if, you know, if we can't get them completely abolished, maybe there's a way to, you know, to at least reduce their, you know, their harm. Yeah. And Great. Oh, well. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir.
Um, with the uh, upcoming presidential election, um, of course, a lot of rhetoric out of both sides, but do you have a, an opinion on uh, which candidate is more likely to improve the patent system? No, they'll both be captured in the same way the legislative process is by these small, concentrated group of beneficiaries who express their opinions. So, unfortunately, I don't, on this issue, it will not be my determining factor when I go to the ballot, which in New York, I can tell you my vote is very important. <laughs> yes, yes, sir, in the back. So the question was, can I comment on the behavior of some people filing patent applications and claiming they're only doing so in a defensive way? Well, I understand why they're doing that. It's the arms race mentality, right? It's what Bill Gates said. Everyone has to get as many patents as they can. Um, and so I don't critique people for doing what's in their interest, just like you know, I don't get mad at cockroaches for coming on my counter when I leave food out. Right? They're just doing what's in their natural best interest. What I would suggest to these people is to make their defensiveness posture uh, something that's reliable on the public. Issue a statement, issue a formal binding message saying we are getting these patents and we promise never to sue someone for infringement unless they sue us first. This is Cisco's default policy and it was well known throughout the industry that Cisco has a no first punch policy. And that's fine. I mean, we can have the arms race. We can go back to 1980, where everyone's getting all their weapons. And we have to ask, as a society, is it worth, like, is your job, should they fire you so that they can hire me to file some patent applications? I don't think it's good for society for me to be working and you not to be working. Because I think you're going to do more productive work for society, writing code or whatever it is you do here, than I will by pushing papers into the patent office. Next question, yes, sir. Could you describe a little bit more uh, how, in, in this uh, example you have of the RU486 uh, being used as a, uh, a way to perform an abortion, how the patent holder would conduct a lawsuit to prevent um, that behavior if there's no provable monetary loss to the patent holder? There doesn't have to be monetary loss because they can go after an injunction. And they probably wouldn't sue women themselves. That'd be kind of bad PR. They'd probably sue any manufacturer of RU486. Now, people say, yeah, but Dan, that's not true. If, if somebody has a patent on something, then they're definitely making it, right? They're not just going to sit on the patent. That whole, I've got the cure for AIDS and I'm not going to make it, that's, that's ridiculous hyperbole. Well, if you do a search for non-gas engines, who do you think some of the biggest owners of non-gas engine patents are? People who have no incentive to make non-gas engines because that's disruptive technology to their business model. And so there are absolutely incentives for people not to practice their own patents. And so in the RU486 case, they'd probably go after the manufacturer of the drug or whoever's paying for the procedure, like health insurance companies for inducement of infringement, uh, you know, but they could, there's nothing stopping them from suing a woman as she walks into a doctor's office. Nothing at all stopping them. And they could get an injunction barring her from doing that. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So uh, I, I spent a year at a patent law firm writing patents uh, applications as an engineer, um, and I'm responsible for several obviously unpatentable pieces of junk. Um, so it, it became That's clear. What, three Hail Marys and uh, leave something <laughs> in the collection. Plate. It became clear to me that uh, the the time and resources and ability available to me was so far outstripped any patent examiner's time and resources. What what do you propose to do about that problem? Well. The patent office is absolutely correct when they say we don't have the resources to do a good enough job. Well, that's because the job they're being told to do by Congress is issue as many patents as you can as fast as you can. Because more patents is good for society. And why is Congress saying this? Because the lobbyist who just left their office with a $100,000 check says patents are good for society. So tell the patent office that. If the patent office was directed 
to behave in a different way, they would do so. I know several people at the Patent Office. I think blaming the Patent Office is a myopic and incorrect view of the patent problem. They're like blaming the muffler for pollution when it's really coming from the engine. So the Patent Office is not where the fix happens because they're not the cause of the problem. And in fact, in the software business method area, not only in the mid-90s were they fighting against software and business method patents, and it was the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit that forced them to allow them, they are now again trying to fight against software and business method patents. And now they have a big case called Bilski at the CAFC where they may actually get the CAFC to go back. So in a lot of areas I've seen, the patent office is actually trying to do the best thing they can, but they've been hamstrung on purpose by Congress to do what lobbyists want them to do, which is benefit this small concentrated group which profits from patents. Thank you for your question. Well, any other questions or comments? Thank you. Yep, one more. Is there something that could be done about professional patent trolls who basically buy up dead patents and, and go around abusing them with no intent to ever manufacture anything? Is, is there a legislative solution to that? Well, I don't have anything against patent, what people call patent trolls or patent. These are companies whose sole business model is to buy patents and go around threatening people or actually suing people and making money. And that's all they do. They don't make any product or service. A lot of these people don't even have phone numbers. They're basically just front organizations for lawsuits. I don't blame them because they're doing just like the defense of patenting. They're doing what's in their own financial interest. This is the collective action problem. They're doing what's best for them, even though it's not good for society, for people to go around chilling conduct and chilling researchers by being a drag on resources. So the solution is in some cases, specific threats to address them through patent challenges. And several of the patents which we've challenged have been owned by businesses that you would call patent trolls. Um, but in a more general way, it's to eliminate the threat of injunctions. And say, if you're not practicing your patent, you can't get an injunction from someone else. All you can get is some reasonable royalty rate. And the judge is going to determine that. And I think that would go a long way towards rewarding these people, which they deserve. They invented something, they deserve some reward, but they don't deserve to be a drag on innovation or have the right or ability to hold up someone else who does want to make the cure for AIDS or does want to make better search technology available. So I don't think you, again, with the patent office, you don't solve the problem at the patent trolls. It's the problem is caused upstream, and that's just where you're seeing one of the symptoms. And this is our home page. So this is a list of matters we've done where we've done specific patent challenges. Uh, Patriot Scientific is one example of a patent licensing company. And so is the Forgent JPEG patent, which you may have heard of. And then these are some, some advocacy work that we've done as well. So again, thank you very much for your time. If you have questions, you want to talk to me in private or email me or give me a call anytime, I'd be more than happy to talk to you. Thanks so much. Thank <laughs> you.